Good morning and welcome to Sunway City, Kuala Lumpur. Well, let me say some introductory words. I am Wu Wing Tai, the lucky person who is the Vice President for Asia for the SDSN and in charge of the KL office. <laughs> Yang Perhomat Nick Nasmi, Minister of Natural Resources, Environment and Climate Change. Tan Siri Jeffrey Chia, founder and chairman of Sunway Group, the largest social enterprise in Malaysia. And my fellow participants in the third ASEAN Workshop on Sustainable Development. Let me put some perspective on the mission that we are embarking on by showing you a picture of Sunway City in the 1970s. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, you are sitting on what used to be the slopes of an abandoned tin mine. Sunway City is an outstanding example of successful land rehabilitation and of creative urban planning. Show the next slide so that we can uh, make, make, uh, not make a liar out of me. Okay, let's go back to the first slide, the beginning. Thank you. My three-word summary of what our workshop is all about are development, resilience, and sustainability. Many of my fellow Malaysians will no doubt recognize that these three words describe, also describe the history of the rapid growth of the Sunway Group, the resilience to the Asian financial crisis, and its constant introductions of pioneering sustainability practices. A recent example of Sunway's innovation in sustainability practices is the mechanism for mobilization of its entire workforce through an in innovative internal carbon pricing mechanism. The mechanism works by setting decarbonization targets for every business unit and the business units that fail to achieve the targeted amount would receive a bonus less than what the units, the other units that achieve their bonus targets. In other words, there is a financial mechanism that constantly motivates the staff to come up with new ways to reduce the carbon footprint of the business unit. And as the first, as this picture clearly shows, Tan Sri Jeffrey Cha is a pioneering environmentalist. In 2016, Tan Sri Jeffrey Cha joined up with Professor Jeffrey Sachs to form the partnership between Sunway University and SDSN to ensure the development, the achievement of the 17 SDGs by 2030. Tan Sri Jeffrey Cha has put almost 20 million US dollars into this partnership to accelerate the achievement of SDGs globally. I, let me give you three examples of the kind of projects that the SDSN Asia office is involved in. The principle of our operations is to mobilize regional collaboration on projects that make a difference. The first project I want to talk about is the ASEAN Green Future Project, which involves nine resident ASEAN country teams designing country-specific packages to scale up climate actions in the countries. This work is being coordinated by SDSN and Climate Works Centre of Monash University, Australia. The second project in regional collaboration is the Science Panel for Southeast Asia Biodiversity. This project is a follow-up of the highly successful study by the science panel, of the science panel for the Amazon on the present state of the Amazon and what are the development pathways that are compatible with the achievement of the 17 SDGs. The newly elected Brazilian president, Lula da Silva, is now globalizing this report of 
the science panel for the Amazon. Just before G20 met in Bali in November last year, he forged an agreement with the Congo and Indonesia to form the OPEC for rainforest. And here in Sunway, SDSN is starting the project by forming the science panel for Borneo, which would involve close collaboration between Indonesian scholars and Malaysian scholars. The third example of region-wide uh, mobilization is more Project 4.7, no, Mission 4.7. Well, excuse me for my excitement. Mission 4.7 is about the delivery of education for sustainable development to schools from K to 12. Mission 4.7 is headed by Pope Francis, former UN General Secretary Pan Kin Moon, Tan Sri Jeffrey Chia, UNESCO Director General Azule, Audrey Azule, and Jeffrey Sachs. SDSN Asia is the Secretariat of Mission 4.7. We know that the co we are in very uncertain times. It is no accident that the SDSN Asia office is found, was found at a time of the worsening of Cold War 2.0. We, we have a hot war in Ukraine and a Cold War in the South China Sea. We know that relations among countries are a combination of cooperation in some areas and competition in other areas. The goal of SDSN Asia is to strengthen cooperation in sustainable development to generate big enough reservoirs of mutual goodwill that will offset the antagonism from competition in the economic and geostrategic spheres. In practice, SDG 17, International Partnership, nearly always plays the role of catalyst in achieving the other 16 SDGs. Fellow participants, it is now time to start our discussion on how to entrench sustainable development practices into our everyday economic life. Let me invite the visionary Tan Siri Jeffrey Cha to kick off our discussions. Tan Siri. Tan Sri Datuk Sri Dr. Jeffrey Chia is the founder and chairman of Sunway Group, one of Southeast Asia's leading conglomerates and the founder and trustee of Jeffrey Chia Foundation. Adopting a social enterprise model, the foundation is the largest of its kind in advancing education in Malaysia. Born in the small tin mining town of Pusing in Perak, Tansri grew up surrounded by the ugly scars of disused mining pools and witnessed firsthand how poverty closed off avenues of advancement for many families. These formative experiences shaped Tansri's convictions that quality education offers the best route out of poverty and that sustainable development is vital to the nation's future well-being. After returning from Melbourne, Australia as a business graduate, he joined a local motor assembly plant as an accountant. He turned to entrepreneurship not long after with a vision to transform 800 acres of abandoned mining lakes into Sunway City, Kuala Lumpur today, Malaysia's first integrated green township. The very founding of Sunway Group is based on the concept of sustainable development. Tansri's business success has allowed him to realize his lifelong dream of setting up a foundation dedicated to nation building and giving back to society. The foundation has dispersed 618 million ringgit in scholarships and grants as of 2022, and it is Tansri's goal to give out several billion ringgit in scholarships during his lifetime. The foundation also established active partnerships with top-tier universities such as Cambridge, Oxford and Lancaster in the UK and Harvard, MIT Boston and UC Berkeley in the US. 
Such collaborations facilitate knowledge transfer and make world-class expertise accessible to Malaysians. Through the foundation, Tansri has also gifted 20 million US dollars to the United Nations to establish the Jeffrey Sachs Center on Sustainable Development at Sunway University and the Asia headquarters of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network at Sunway University to lead continent-wide sustainability initiatives. In 2021, Sunway University set up the Sunway Center for Planetary Health, which will work with existing institutions at Sunway University to further advance the sustainability agenda in this part of the world. Tansri is one of four co-chairs driving Mission 4.7, a global initiative for the United Nations that aims to mandate governments worldwide to include a sustainability curriculum in all schools from kindergarten to secondary school levels. For his commitment to nation-building and full embrace of the sustainability agenda, Tansri has been conferred 12 honorary doctorates by leading universities worldwide. He is also a member of Harvard University's Global Advisory Council and the only Malaysian and the second philanthropist in Asia to have been recognized four times as Forbes Asia Hero of Philanthropy. In 2008, Tansri was appointed by Australia's Prime Minister an Officer of the Order of Australia, one of the country's most prestigious and highest recognitions conferred to a non-citizen. Thank you for a very good introduction, Professor Wu. Yang, Bro Yang Brohamad, Nick Nasmi, Nick, Nick Ahmad, Minister of Natural Resources, Environment and Climate Change. Professor Jeffrey Sachs, President of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solution Network. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Summer City. Kuala Lumpur. As most of you know, Sunway University houses the Asia headquarters of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, or UNSDSN. This Asia headquarters is one of only three such global centers in the world working on continent-wide sustainability solutions. It ranks Sunway City Kuala Lumpur, which oversees Asia, alongside New York City, which covers the Americas, and Paris, which is responsible for Europe and Africa. This conference here is a prime example of this mission to advance the sustainability agenda in the region. Now, ladies and gentlemen, even as Asian, as the Asian countries are undertaking efforts towards sustainable development, many challenges remain. The recent Global Sustainable Development Report 2023 paints a bleak picture. As we arrive at the halfway point of the 2030 agenda, the report states that some 85% of the SDG targets will not be met if we continue on our current path. It is not hard to see why. The world just experienced its hottest week ever since such records have been kept. At the rate we are going, 2023 may well end up as the year with the highest temperatures in recorded history. And just this week, more than 200 of the world's top economies signed an open letter urging the UN and the World Bank to act decisively to reverse the extreme and growing levels of social and economic inequality. In addition, there is a war raging in the heart of Europe where US China tensions are growing. 
We are now living in a time of extreme uncertainty. I do not need to go into the details. Instead, I would like to focus on the fundamental question of where do we, where do we go from here? We must have the courage to take the necessary steps to build a future that is economically just, socially inclusive, and environmentally sustainable for our world. Ladies and gentlemen, unlike most of you here, I am neither an academic nor an expert. I'm just an entrepreneur doing business with a heart. And a philanthropist, <clears throat> and a philanthropist committed to nation building and shaping a brighter future for our world. As an entrepreneur, I am focused on outcomes. As a philanthropist, I am committed to making a positive impact on society. And based on these beliefs, I fully believe that implementing the sustainability agenda is no longer an option, but an urgent imperative. I am an optimist by nature. Even in these deeply challenging times, I strongly believe that humanity can and will rise to the challenges that confront us. And I believe a major factor for now, for how we have come to where we are today, is our obsession with economic growth as measured by the gross domestic product or GDP. GDP has come to be seen as, a, as the proxy for the wealth of a nation. But while GDP can be effective in measuring how much we produce, export, or consume, it falls short in the valuing the quality of life. And we need a, wide, a wider lens to measure how we are doing. The good news is that the path towards this transformation has already been charted for us in the form of the 17 SDGs by the United Nations. This comprehensive vision towards sustainable development is perhaps best summed up by our friend here, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, who helped design the SDGs. He said, and I quote, the concept of sustainable development stands for a holistic approach to globalization, one that combines economic growth with social inclusion, environmental sustainability, and peaceful societies. I hope I have quoted Professor Jeffrey Sachs right. Thank you. I trust that the video which was shown just now will give you an idea about what we at Sunway and the Jeffrey Chia Foundation are doing to advance the sustainability agenda in this region. Now, ladies and gentlemen, at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, there were hopes that the devastation caused by this virus would help spark a deep reflection in how we value our lives and well-being of our planet. Clearly, we need a reset in our economic, financial, and industrial architecture if we are to address the challenges of what is now labeled as the Anthropocene era. I have already referred to the obsession with growth as measured by GDP. But growth for what, for whom, and at what cost to the planet? As the late US Senator Robert F. Kennedy said, and I quote, GDP measures everything except that 
which makes life worthwhile. Unquote. Even more to the point, why do we continue to rely on a metric designed for the industrial era when we are clearly living in a vastly different economic landscape? And given our current times, we need new ideas and new perspectives. And I firmly convinced that we cannot overcome the challenges of the digital age by using analog mindsets. Ladies and gentlemen, in this context, I personally feel that the discussion and debates regarding the state of the planet and its people should expand beyond science and data. And I believe that it is equally important that we pay attention to the role of ethical values in building a sustainable future. And in other words, in the, and in the words of the late Muhammad Gandhi, and I quote, the world has enough for everyone's needs, but not enough for everyone's greed, unquote. I hope this aspect of ethical values is given a more active voice in addressing humanity's challenges, including in your deliberation here today. As the Native American proverb says, and I quote, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestor. We borrow it from our children, unquote. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have always believed that each of us should have a higher purpose in life. For me personally, that purpose is to give back to society in an impactful and building a better world for our children. And my personal motto is I aspire to inspire before I expire. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that our example at Sunway and the Jeffrey Chia Foundation will encourage other corporations and individuals in the region to adopt and promote the sustainability agenda. We strongly believe that sustainability and profitability can go hand in hand and that we can all do well by doing good. Our efforts here at Sunway and the Jeffrey Chia Foundation are driven by the conviction that realizing the 17 SDGs is not the responsibility of governments alone. Building a sustainable future requires the commitment of all segments of society, that is, the private sector, academia, civil society, and, of course, every single one of us. We are all in this together, ladies and gentlemen. In closing, I would like to thank Professor Wu and his team at the UNSDSN for organizing this timely <coughs> AWSD 2023 conference. And I wish you all a very productive and fruitful discussion and building a better tomorrow for the world. Thank you and enjoy the day. We had originally had uh, the Secretary General of ASEAN, Kao Kim Moon, coming. He's a longtime friend of both Tan Sri Chia and Jeffrey Sachs. But the Cambodian election is being held two days from now. And so he's home serving his country. So he has sent us and a recording. So may we have his uh, message. Agency Anwar Ibrahim, Prime Minister of Malaysia. 
I can see ministers from the SMM states and partners. I can see Amida Sasia Alisha Bana, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Professor Jeffrey Sachs, President of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to extend my sincere appreciation to the government of Malaysia for graciously hosting this workshop. I also wish to offer my sincere congratulations to Professor Jeffrey Sachs, Tantri Dr. Jeffrey Chia, Professor Wu Wingtai, and the entire team at the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network for organizing this important workshop. Initially, I planned to attend this workshop physically, but due to my unexpected commitment to observe the general elections in Cambodia, I had to give a pre-recorded remarks. It is my great pleasure and honor to address you today at the ASEAN Minister's Workshop on Sustainable Development. This workshop is a valuable platform to discuss the crucial issues surrounding sustainable development, particularly within the context of ASEAN. These discussions are crucial in outlining our collective efforts to keep ASEAN sustainable and economically vibrant. I still remember that I had the great opportunity to be present in some way at the second iteration of this event in 2019. At the time, we deliberated on the plans of ASEAN countries towards sustainable development, only to be derailed by the pandemic that shortly followed that meeting. Much has changed since 2019, globally and in Southeast Asia. Attention on sustainability is increasingly urgent. The Sustainable Development Report 2023, published in June 2023, revealed that at the current pace of progress, none of the sustain, Sustainable Development Goals SDG will be achieved by 2030. In addition, less than 20% of the SDG targets are on track to be accomplished on average. These findings reinforce the need to reassess our approach and allocate necessary resources to accelerate progress towards the SDGs. As indeed well in the areas of poverty reduction SDG 1 and quality of education SDG 4. However, the COVID-19 pandemic slowed down the progress we have made with the SDGs and ASEAN development initiatives. It also exposed the risks, vulnerabilities, and inequalities that have plagued us for many years. And adequate health systems, gaps in social protection, structural inequalities, environmental degradation, and the climate crisis. The spotlight on these inequalities calls for inclusive action. This includes assessing our preparedness for future shocks, such as financial and health crises, enhancing economic and digital resilience, addressing gaps in social protection, and transitioning to sustainable and green economies. As in demonstrated strong economic resilience with 5.7% growth in 2022, driven by robust domestic consumption, enhanced investment, and expanded trade. While growth prospects are dampened by moderating global demand coupled with high inflation and tighter finance, the region is projected to maintain a positive growth trajectory at 4.7% in 2023 and 5.0% in 2024. ASEAN is taking active steps to enhance the resilience of our member states, including through the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework, the adoption of the ASEAN Declaration on Human Resource Development for the Changing World of Work also reflects the region's steadfast commitment to equip our workforce with the competence to be relevant and resilient in the future. The ASEAN region's commitment towards the implementation of SDGs will reinforce at different high-level meetings. 
For example, the second ASEAN Ministerial Dialogue on Accelerating Actions to Achieve the SDGs has highlighted addressing poverty as a top priority. This includes addressing complex and interlocking challenges that low-income families face and ensure inclusive and sustainable growth in the region. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as the region emerges from the pandemic, ASEAN will double our efforts on six priorities, namely peace, prosperity, planet, people, partnership and potentials. These priorities are known as the six Ps, also resonate with several of the sustainable development goals. First, building on the prosperity of ASEAN remains a top priority to further economic development for our people and ensure that no one is left behind. Second, we cannot take our peace for granted. ASEAN has to continue what it has been doing in the past 55 years in maintaining peace, stability and security, which has been the strong foundation for the region. Third, focusing on priorities of the planet, especially the environment, climate change, and the green economy remains necessary. Fourth, we need to protect and empower our people, especially the youth and women, to further strengthen ASEAN community building, ASEAN integration in people-to-people -people ties. Fifth, it is essential to further enhance partnerships within ASEAN and also with external partners to ensure our work will remain relevant and reach our people and sectors. And six, transforming ASEAN's pot potentials into tangible benefits for the ASEAN community is an important priority. The ASEAN 2025 and the post-2025 vision outline our future plans, which also contains our unwavering commitment to sustainable development. The ASEAN member states are committed to work together to implement the vision as its tenets, uh, also their national interests. The Madini framework instituted by Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim is a commendable example of sustainable development that has brought into national policy. By promoting a green and capable economy, the Madini, the Madini framework aligns well with ASEAN's vision of achieving sustainable development goals including poverty eradication, social inclusivity, and environmental sustainability. At the global level, ASEAN's perspective on sustainable development goal is deeply aligned with the SDGs. Paris Agreement on Climate Change, Convention on Biological Diversity, and Kunming Montreal Biodiversity Framework, and other related multilateral environmental agreements. Through the framework of action on complementarities between ASEAN Community Vision 2025 and the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, ASEAN has taken significant steps to track and measure SDG progress in the region. Through, energy, through synergy and complementarities in our action, we can amplify our collective impact and accelerate sustainable de development. In line with our commitment to sustainable development, the work on realizing SDGs under the ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific, or AOIP, will be a major contribution of the region to the global community. The AOIP serves as an anchor for our cooperation and partnerships on SDGs, and a platform for the promotion of enabling environment for peace, stability, and prosperity in the region. Guided by the com Complementarities Roadmap 2020-2025, ASEAN has a significant role in advancing the region's resilience, infrastructure, sustainable consumption and production, poverty er eradication, and sustainable management of natural resources. The AOIP and the Complementarities Roadmap will enable ASEAN to achieve new norm in sustainable development. Collaboration and support from the ASEAN Dialogue Partners on the AOIP are crucial as we work towards the realization of SDGs related outcomes. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we will need to leverage 
on new trends and growth opportunities in our programs and activities, which will ensure that lives and livelihoods are protected with no one left behind. It will also allow ASEAN to be responsive to future trends and allow our region to remain an attractive trade and investment proposition for our global partners. Significant developments that will shape ASEAN's post-2025 future include digital transformation, changing geoeconomics, decarbonization, green growth, sustainable use of biodiversity, demographic changes, and the emerging care economy, among others. We must recognize that attention and investments in these emerging growth areas have the potential to alleviate inequalities and help achieve multiple SDGs simultaneously. I'm pleased to share ASEAN's collective actions to contribute to the global sustainable development agenda. First, it is ASEAN's priority to advance green growth and low carbon development strategies. In fact, seven out of 10 ASEAN countries have pledged to be carbon neutral or net zero by 2050, with Indonesia pledging net zero by 2060. ASEAN has surpassed its aspiration energy target by achieving 21% of energy intensity reduction and 13.9% renewable energy share in the ASEAN total primary energy supply in 2018. The region will further bolster its efforts through the ASEAN strategy for carbon neutrality, ASEAN climate finance strategy, ASEAN center for climate change, and other regional assessment reports to promote evidence-based decision-making on climate change. These endeavors will continue to strengthen ASEAN's ability to reduce greenhouse gases emissions. Second, ASEAN has been pursuing transition to circular economy approaches. Several initiatives include the implementation plan for the framework for circular economy for the ASEAN economic community and its work program. We also have the ASEAN EU circular economy stakeholders holder platform to foster partnerships and generate innovative solutions. In addition, the ASEAN Sustainable Consumption Production SCP framework has been developed and will serve as a guiding reference to align efforts in promoting sustainable practices and circular economy principles. Third, ASEAN continues to harness digital transformation. Since 2021, ASEAN has introduced several initiatives in its digital integrated ecosystem, including the Mandatory Begawan Roadmap and ASEAN Digital Transformation Agenda to, to accelerate ASEAN economic recovery and digital economy integration. The ASEAN Digital Master Plan, the work plan on the implementation of the ASEAN Agreement on Electronic Commerce 2021-2025, the ASEAN Cybersecurity Cooperation Strategy 2021-2025, and the Fourth Industrial Rev Revolution Int Integrated Strategy. The acceleration of these initiatives will support ASEAN's vision of becoming a leading digital community and economic bloc, driven by secure and transformative digital services, technologies, and ecosystems. By the transformation in the areas of trade facilitation, cross-border digital services, intellectual property, and digital transformation of the education system, will reinforce ASEAN's commitment to providing access to safe and digital learning opportunities, ensuring equitably, equitability access to education and lifelong learning, and promoting an inclusive and future-ready education system in ASEAN. Fourth, ASEAN is strengthening its commitment in promoting decent work, protection of vulnerable groups, and increasing youth participation at the national and regional levels. ASEAN has adopted the ASEAN Declaration on the Protection of Migrant Workers and Family Members in Crisis Situations and other agreements to support the inclusion of migrant workers and their families. The ASEAN Guiding Document to implement the ASEAN Declaration on Promoting Competitiveness 
resilience and agility of workers for the future of work. We will also encourage the harmonization of skill training, standards, and professional certification systems, and foster efforts to increase labor productivity of ASEAN member states. ASEAN continues to promote and protect women's rights and participation through different regional platforms, such as the ASEAN Women's Leaders Summit, as well as conferences and workshops. The ASEAN Regional Plan of Action on Women's Peace and Security, WPS, including the high-level dialogue on this pertinent issue, are also steadfast commitments of ASEAN to gender equality and for protection of women's rights, especially in situations of traditional security challenges and non-traditional and emerging threats. In addition, ASEAN recognizes the use as future leaders of ASEAN, underscoring the importance of providing them with ample opportunities and platforms to develop their potential through workshops and meaningful engagement with the leaders. The ASEAN leaders interface with the representative of ASEAN youth during the ASEAN summit recognizes youth roles in regional policy and development. Fifth, ASEAN continues to ensure the health and well-being of its people. ASEAN continues to focus on building and strengthening essential health services and prepare the region for future pandemics. There has been strong progress towards, towards enhancing capacity of public health services to enable health emergency response, including the ASEAN Center for Research and Development on vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics, ASEAN Work Plan on HIV and AIDS for 2021-2025, and ensure an end to the AIDS pandemic in ASEAN by 2030. The latest development in this area is the ASEAN Leaders Declaration on One Health Initiative adopted this year, which catalyzes the region's work on ensuring health and well-being for all ASEAN peoples. This initiative involves the development of a joint action plan on One Health to improve regional and national capacity and capabilities and the establishment of One Health Network, which will hasten the development and strengthening of multi-sectoral collaboration and coordination of One Health Initiative among the ASEAN member states through connections with existing and potential national mechanisms. And lastly, ASEAN recognizes the critical role of rural development in the achievement of the SDGs and ASEAN Community Vision 2025. During the 42nd ASEAN Summit in Le Bon Majeur in May 2023, ASEAN leaders agreed to establish an ASEAN village network that will serve as a platform for whole of community and inclusive participation facilitate collaboration and cooperation among villages, exchange strategies to improve digital infrastructure, and facilitate better and wider rural products access to markets. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, while considerable initiatives and regional mechanisms have been made, there are still opportunities for strengthening existing and forging new partnerships and harness our collective potential. It is my hope that this ASEAN Minister Workshop on sustain, Sustainable Development can advance our partnership and actions. I look forward to learning from national efforts and innov innovative solutions to scale up inclusive action. In closing, let me call for our collective commitment to the common goal of sustainable development, driven by the urgency to address pressing challenges and build a better future for all. Substantial financial help and technology transfer from developed nations are necessary if ASEAN nations were to scale up their climate actions to achieve net zero emissions of greenhouse gases. The developing countries must de de deliver on the help that they promise at the signing of the Paris Climate Treaty in 2015. Together, we can forge a path towards inclusive, sustainable, and resilient outcomes for ASEAN. I wish you fruitful discussions at this timely workshop. Thank you. Thank you.
Now, our next speaker is Minister Nick Nasmi. I can go and through the long record of his outstanding scholarship and political leadership. I would do the easier thing by offering him the bribe of advising you to go to your neighbor bookstore, pick up the book, Son of Malaysia, read through the last five, the first five pages and the last five pages. If you do not buy the book, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> so our next speaker has a very difficult portfolio. The portfolio covers natural resources, environment, and climate. Traditionally, the Natural Resources Ministry is about the exploitation of natural resources for prosperity, a master-slave relationship between man and nature. Environment, it is the part about building peaceful coexistence between man and nature. So we have a person who has been given two tasks that are hard to reconcile if you look at the way that things have been done in the past. Luckily, he's guided by the Madani Malaysia principles, which effectively makes him the minister of peace, progress, and prosperity. Let me explain. It is not just peace between man and man, but also peace between man and nature. And we go beyond, be, beyond peace between man and nature. We also insist on progress between man and nature. The relationship has to be a synergistic one that yields win-win outcomes for both, and hence ensuring the outcome of economic prosperity and sustainability. So may I have the Minister of Peace, Progress, and Prosperity, please. Yang berbahagia, Tan Sri, Datuk Sri Dr. Jeffrey Chia, Chair of SSDN Malaysia, Founder and Chairman of Sunway Group, and Chancellor of Sunway University, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, President of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, Dr. Rosemary G. Adilin, Under Secretary for Policy and Planning of the National Economic and Development Authority of the Philippines. Yang berbahagia, Tan Sri Razman Hashim, Deputy Chair of the Sunway Group. Professor Sibrandes Popema, President of Sunway University. Professor Elizabeth Lee, CEO of Sunway Education Group. Professor Wu Wing Tai. Vice President for Asia and Head of the KL Office, UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. <coughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum, salam sejahtera and a very good morning. I'd like to thank uh, Prof just now for giving a very generous introduction and for trying very hard to sell my book. <laughs> uh, I think I have to learn from uh, Professor Sachs on how to sell my book better on the market. I'm very pleased to be speaking at the ASEAN Workshop on Sustainable Development 2023, and I would like to thank the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, the Jeffrey Chia Foundation, and ASLI for not only inviting me to be a panelist, but holding for the conference like this in the first place. I don't think it's necessary for us to have a long discussion on why sustainable development matters. The result of us rejecting it will likely mean the end of our survival as a species on this planet. We only have one planet. As has been said many times, addressing climate change and hence its related imperatives, including enshrining sustainable development and a just energy transition, may likely be the greatest challenges of our time. I think what is very apt about this session Converting crisis to opportunity, the ASEAN way, and what attracted me to it is that it highlights that countries cannot address climate change 
or sustainable, sustainable development in isolation. We are all interconnected and climate change, as again the saying goes, respects no boundaries. To be sure, ASEAN, since its founding in 1967, helped to ensure peace, neutrality and connectivity in our region. It can, however, do much more and it is a fascinating prospect to see it as a possible avenue for us to strengthen sustainable development and win the war against climate change. Make no mistake, ASEAN matters. Southeast Asia is the fulcrum of Asia. We have an unbeatable strategic location, a combined population of nearly 670 million and a combined GDP of 3 trillion US dollars. We are the fifth largest economy in the world and this is only likely to grow. Thus, there can be no Asian century without Southeast Asia. And there can be no Asian century without a sustainable one. And so, what we in Southeast Asia fail or succeed to do when it comes to sustainable development will have an Asian-wide, if not global, implications. Today, therefore, I'd like to spend just a short time on what Malaysia has done with regards to sustainable development and then say a few things about what can be done on an ASEAN-wide scale. Malaysia has, one, pledged in our nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 45% to 2030. Two, we have also announced under the 12th Malaysia Plan that the country will seek to achieve net zero emissions earliest by 2050. Three, we are developing a long-term low emissions development strategy to provide context for long-term climate planning, development priorities, vision and future development direction. Fourth, we are also working hard on a Climate Change Act which will establish a legal framework on climate change mitigation and compliance mechanisms. We are also, finally after many, many years and many, many ministers, we are going to introduce this year an Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act with the aim of regulating energy efficiency and conservation practices. We talk a lot about clean sources of renewable energy, but at the other end of the equation is also about using our energy efficiently. The N uh, six, the NRECC has also collaborated with the International Renewable Energy Agency to publish Malaysia Energy Transition Outlook, MITO, which explores the potential long-term energy pathway for our country to attain a cleaner and more sustainable energy system. Seventh, Malaysia's generation capacity for renewable energy will be increased to create new economic opportunities, where by 2050, this new government has announced we are targeting 70% of energy capacity to come from renewable energy. Next, we also have allowed the cross-border renewable energy trading. This is the decision that we made in May 2023, and this will allow us to uh, get the scale of renewable energy and to explore new technologies uh, which are too expensive for our current tariffs, things like battery storage um, and other uh, forms of uh, new technology which we believe can be uh, economical once we are allowed to sell our renewable energy abroad. And last but not least, we are also uh, talking about uh, the National Energy Transition Roadmap and this, the first phase will be launched next week with uh, key flagship projects where the private sector can participate in order for us to accelerate our energy transition. In terms of ASEAN, it should be stressed that the above-mentioned cross-border renewable energy trading is part of our contribution to the creation of the long-awaited ASEAN power grid. We know that with more renewable energy, we need a better and much more uh, connected uh, grid across the region. That's the experience of Europe. We've seen that. Currently, Malaysia and Singapore are buying hydroelectricity from Laos via Thailand. 
uh, but there are so many more opportunities. Interconnection between the peninsula and Sumatra, interconnection, um, the long-awaited uh, interconnection between Sarawak and peninsula. Um, Sarawak is already supplying energy to Kalimantan in Indonesia, and now with the upcoming uh, creation of the new capital city in Kalimantan. Uh, these are all opportunities for ASEAN to be connected and Malaysia is at the strategic location of being at the centre of all this. At the same time, ASEAN itself should be doing more in terms of RE. We know that some countries have been uh, taking the lead in, in these matters. Philippines, for example, is one of the countries that has the largest amount of battery storage uh, in the region. And one of the things that has helped the Philippines, I think, is because the tariffs uh, are such that makes it economical for them to pursue that. Um, Vietnam, we know, has gone very far in terms of solar energy. Uh, and in terms of capacity or potential capacity, ASEAN has the potential to get, generate 800 gigawatts of solar energy 300 gigawatts of wind energy and 200 gigawatts of hydroelectricity. The region's abundant renewable energy resources provide a competitive advantage for producing green hydrogen. The state of Sarawak has taken a lead on this, which requires large amounts of renewable electricity. As such, there is a need for greater and more concentrated regional collaboration in renewable energy. There is a need for not only regional developmental policies and roadmaps, but also working towards common policies and regulatory frameworks. We also need attractive investment policies and strategies to promote as well as facilitate its adoption in sectors like manufacturing and transportation, as well as reduce costs. This gives us the opportunity to not only address climate change and the energy transition, and create new economic opportunities, but also draw closer together as ASEAN. The World Economic Forum has also argued that while developing countries in Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East are committed to energy transition and, has, and have vast renewable energy resources, we lack the finances and technical know-how to develop them fully. The UNF uh, the UNFCCC has called for financial assistance from parties with more financial resources to those that are more vulnerable but less wealthy. This recognises that the capacity of countries to prevent and cope with the consequences of climate change vary enormously. Developing countries, in particular, require substantial financial support to undertake climate action. It is crucial for developed nations to fulfil their commitment to provide 100 billion US dollars per year in climate finance as pledged under the UNFCCC. We have seen year in, year out, in one COP after another, where grand promises are made by developed countries about helping the developing world to transition. But when it comes to uh, cashing the check, when we go to the bank, many developing countries have found that it's very difficult to cash the check. The need for equity must not be forgotten. According to ASEAN, and considering the various different definitions across the, country, uh, the different countries, there are more than 70 million micro, small, and medium enterprises in the region, the MSMEs. This reportedly account for up to 99% of total establishments in member states, as well as contributing to 85% employment, 44.8% GDP, and 18% of national exports. To me, the MSMEs are hence the frontliners, not only for ASEAN's economy, but also in the journey towards climate action and energy transition. The government, including Malaysia, are of course assisting them in various ways. And yet, many, I am sure, may find the energy transition as well as sustainability demands very daunting. Unlike the big companies, they can't afford to hire chief sustainability officers. We must also make sure that the MSMEs will be able to make the energy transition. It will not be a just one without them. ASEAN ought to stand together on many things, and this includes the need for just climate financing, as I mentioned, and indeed how weighty measures like ESG, climate action, and energy transition are defined. This unity needs to be forged 
not just at the government to government level, but also between civil society and business. We certainly hope to pursue this, especially at international forums like the upcoming COP28 in Dubai, which will be a crucial landmark in the history of the Paris Agreement and where our delegation will be led by Prime Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim. Much, of course, can be said about this topic. The facts are clear. The science is clear. We need to make the economics work, but fundamentally, we need to have the political will, and that's something that the task is on my shoulders and on the government's shoulders to deliver. We sometimes forget, you know, the science is very clear. You know, you can repeat the science again and again. We are feeling the effects now. But often enough, we lose the argument not because we do not have the facts or the science with us, but we lose the argument simply because we are not able to tell a good story to convince the public. That is a challenge. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that is a challenge not just for politicians, but for any advocate who wants to convince that we need to do the change. At the end of the day, what is needed is for governments, businesses, non-governmental organizations, and all individuals to embark on a comprehensive trans transformation in our approach to sustainability. Indeed, in the way we do work, we do business, and we live. We should be forging linkages with our counterparts in ASEAN, the relationship must be consistently be renewed and nourished rather than be taken for granted. Addressing climate change is not a responsibility limited to the present generation alone. I think as we've seen from the speech and presentation by Tan Sri Jeffrey Chia, it extends to future generations as well. But if we can do the things that are certainly within our grasp in our lifetimes, we can give our children and their children a fighting chance to continue and even win the war. Thank you. Let me now welcome back to the stage for the second time in the last three, oh, well, thanks to COVID there's been delayed. The, the, the COVID delayed return of Dr. Rosemary Idalon from the Philippines. She is the Under Secretary of the Department of National Development and Planning. She is not only in charge of the formulation of the plan, she also takes responsibility in the implementation of the plan. So, Philippines continues in its tradition of inclusive management of in having strong women in the right places. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wu. And uh, uh, as mentioned by Professor Wu, this is actually my second time here. And uh, uh, it always gives me pleasure to, to be here because uh, I, I know, uh, I, I've seen that video before, <laughs> the picture of, uh, of the Sunway, the before and after. And therefore, it gives me hope that uh, certainly transformation can happen. And uh, just to correct, we're not in charge of implementation. <laughs> we are in charge of monitoring. Uh, uh, we are in charge of the policy reform agenda, of course, uh, advocating for the reforms. And that is where I come in with respect to uh, uh, speaking about uh, turning crisis into opportunities. But once again, thank you to the organizers for um, inviting me here to this uh, very uh, prestigious event. My, my uh, of course, my... Um, uh, greetings as well to uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs and uh, to uh, uh, Professor Wu and uh, uh, I don't know if uh, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Chai is still here, <laughs> but uh, many, many thanks and uh, I'm really happy to be in the same room with, uh, with those who uh, share our passion for sustainable development. So, so first, uh, well, Proceeding to, uh, to my talk, I, uh, I would like to beg your indulgence for now because uh, I want to be a bit more um, conceptual. I want to clarify certain conceptual issues first. Yeah, because I was uh, actually a researcher before I became, before I joined government. So uh, I always uh, 
have that uh, discipline of a researcher. I'm an I'm a statistician turned econometrician turned economist. So, uh, first of all, let me just clarify the concepts of crisis and opportunities, actually within the usual theory of change. So within the theory of change, we're familiar with that, uh, with that transition from, um, from inputs to outputs to outcomes to impact. Where does the crisis come in? <laughs> and where does the opportunity come in? So I would say that a crisis happens when a shock occurs and it affects many individuals and families who are unable to cope with the shock and resulting in undesirable outcomes. It's actually also the difference between a calamity and a disaster. So um, a calamity, you know, is a, a shock, usually uh, a weather-related uh, shock, but then when uh, it results in a grave damage or loss of lives and property, then it becomes classified as a disaster. And therefore, when it affects uh, several families, several individuals who are unable to cope with the shock, and when the, uh, the state-sponsored intervention or social protection or assistance, as you may call it, are not uh, adequate to respond to the shock, then you uh, a result, uh, the crisis results. So it becomes uh, compounded and even protracted if, there's not, if the response is inadequate. Now it's also important to distinguish between changes and shocks because changes actually occur every time and everywhere. But the changes that matter uh, in the case of uh, you know, development, the changes that matter are those that affect the production function of the individual or the family. So meanwhile, and when I say production function, I mean you know, the utility that is uh, comprehensive. In the case of the Philippines, uh, we would say it's really about uh, uh, achieving your ambition, the long-term ambition, which is for uh, strongly rooted family and community ties, a comfortable lifestyle, a secure future. For those who know Filipino, that's matatag, maginhawa, panatag na buhay. So, meanwhile, shocks are changes that are outside the norm. So they are, you know, not your usual change. In the case of the Philippines, as you know, we are visited by uh, at least 20 cyclones a year. So that's within the norm. So if we get visited by less than that, like the El Nino, then that's a shock. Or if it's, uh, you know, many, much more than that, then that's a shock. And if unaddressed or beyond the coping mechanism, then this may greatly constrain the production capacity of individual, the family, or society. And then that becomes the problem, that becomes the crisis. On the other hand, opportunities are considered external or probably peripheral to this system of the input-output outcome impact. Um, uh, uh, but then we are able to internalize uh, this, uh, this external event or external development, and we can then transform this into another input. And so it goes back to that system. So for instance, a housing project can temporarily increase demand for ready-to-eat meals while the construction is ongoing. So there's that opportunity. But of course, turning this opportunity as internalizing them and then so that it goes back to the input, output, etc. This does not happen as a matter of course. There are so many other things that need to be there. Now the bigger challenge is turning this compounded undesirable outcomes or the crisis into an opportunity. It does not happen as a matter of course. Now, indicate, crises actually indicate a need for reforms, but reforms are themselves shocks in the policy space, in the regulatory space. And like any shock, not many people want reforms it disturbs the status quo. So there are lots of, uh, you know, com com competing, uh, competing forces when you go for reforms. But when a crisis occurs, then stakeholders become aware that reforms may need to be done. 
And policymakers, first of all, will need to weigh the cost of undertaking the reforms versus the benefits. Of course, the benefits would largely depend on the likelihood that the shock will happen again, or that this new thing, this, this crisis, will now define the new normal. Uh, so meaning that uh, we really need to undertake the reform. But assuming that the reform is really warranted, the next thing to remember is that it's better to strike while the iron is hot because the support for change or for the reform will likely wane as the, as the impact of the crisis also declines. So I would suggest three things. We have undertaken several reforms during my uh, now 10 years in government. Uh, first, be clear as to the reform that is needed. Be strategic and always be able to bring it back to that, you know, the, the, the way uh, they would understand it, the way legislators would understand this theory of change from input to output, outcome to impact. Number two, again, the value proposition. You have to be very, you have to be prepared. You have to do your complete staff work with respect to um, the stakeholder mapping, that's very, very important. The uh, estimate of the costs and benefits of that reform. And then very important, engage stakeholders. If necessary, be ready to compensate the losers. So I, I also uh, like the, uh, um, one of the advice of, uh, of Minister uh, when he said that, uh, you know, you have to be ready to do to tell the story. Because as they say in sales, remember, facts tell, but stories sell. So you really have to, uh, you know, all those uh, models, Professor Sachs, of course, <laughs> we, uh, oh, of course, Professor Sachs is also good at telling stories. And so we need that as well, especially for those in government. I'd like to share with you, yes, uh, just uh, three examples of, uh, of this, uh, you know, crisis turned into opportunities and then to reforms. First is the, um, uh, the crisis of uh, rice inflation that we had back in 2017. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with the, uh, with the history of rice in the, in the Philippines, so of course, rice is a staple in the country. We love eating rice, breakfast, lunch, dinner. <laughs> but we are 110 million people, okay? And this 110 million people is scattered over 8,000, about 8,000 islands. We have 30 million hectares of land, about 10 million hectares of uh, agricultural land, but again, uh, scattered over 8,000 islands. And of course, we get visited by cyclones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so we have uh, very, very serious um, constraints with respect to being able to, um, to produce rice very efficiently. But the problem is rice is a political good in the case of the Philippines. So it still absorbs, uh, the, the agriculture sector still absorbs the biggest chunk of uh, employment, of course, next to services. But for, that, uh, for agriculture, it's about 26% of employment. Uh, so at that time that uh, there was this, oh, and, uh, and we were doing what we call quantitative restrictions in the case of rice trade. In 1994, when the Philippines um, acceded to the WTO, we exempted rice and corn. But we asked for uh, you know, some time allowance, give us 20 years, <laughs> 20 years to, uh, to adjust to this. And then uh, I, I think at the end of uh, 10 years, we uh, submitted uh, you know, corn can be under this uh, WTO regime, but not yet the rice. And so, uh, after the 20 years is up, we were still not ready to uh, exceed the rice. And therefore, uh, at the time, we asked for another extension, but that was with concession to so many countries. We had to pay so many countries in terms of concessionary uh, trade agreements, et cetera, et cetera. So we were really, um, we, we were really um, very, very uh, gung-ho on uh, undertaking this reform 
on, uh, on rice trade, meaning just tarify the rice, not do this quantitative restriction anymore. And at the time, it so happened that the, uh, the official um, was, uh, um, I think was new in public service. And so um, he would always uh, announce, he would always announce that, you know, rice is dwindling, the stocks of rice is dwindling, but that's actually just the stocks in his warehouse. So anyway, so it's been dwindling. And so the, uh, the, the price, of course, uh, escalated. And uh, since it's only government that controls the imports of rice, and therefore it escalated some more, et cetera, et cetera. And this is when we were really, um, we really insisted that we need to go into this uh, uh, rice tarification. So again, the, the good thing is we have done our studies way, way back. We have done our value proposition. And so it was kind of difficult, you know, you have this rice price inflation, why would you want to tarify rice? So again, we had to get our story straight, you know, that narrative that uh, is really about liberalizing the trading. You need to make sure that you have, that government does not have monopoly over the rice trade. Leave it up to the market. You have many consumers, many producers. You know, it makes sense to, to, to have a liberalized trading regime. We can compensate the losers. The losers would be the rice farmers. First of all, we tarify the rice, so we impose a 35% tariff on the rice, the same with the, uh, the AFTA. And then uh, we make use of these revenues, the tariff revenues, plow it back to the sector in terms of uh, research and development, in terms of mechanization, you know, those things that will make the rice farms productive, more productive. It was still a long battle, but uh, we were able to, uh, to do it, so that was good. And that really helped us, so that even during the crisis uh, last year, when uh, you know, we had this uh, Russia-Ukraine war, et cetera, all this price crisis, rice inflation was just at 3%. So that was very good for us. My next example is the Philippine Action Plan for Sustainable Consumption and Production. We started working on this back in 2017. Because um, um, when, uh, so we, we had the, uh, the start of the SDGs in 2016, and we did some of this, uh, you know, the network analysis uh, being espoused by the UN, UN DESA. And we saw that uh, SDG 12 is the most connected to all the other SDGs. It's a pivotal SDG. And so we said, we need to have something, something very, very, you know, radical in terms of uh, achieving or, or trying to uh, achieve this sustainable consumption and production. So we came up with this PAP for us, SCP, Philippine Action Plan for Sustainable Consumption and Production. It's actually a very comprehensive action plan, beginning with uh, institutionalization of the natural capital accounting, coming up with policy reforms, regulations as well, uh, to regulate uh, you know, to make sure that we have responsible consumption, responsible production, penalizing, of course, those who will be violating this, the infrastructure that's needed, the research agenda, as well as the education that is needed. We were done with it uh, by mid-2019. We presented the draft to the legislators, and then COVID came. So it had to take, you know, a back burner. We had to eradicate it to the back burner. Um, but the thing is, um, we know that it is something that, uh, that we need to be done. And therefore, we had to, uh, again, first be clear as to the reform that is needed. We know that that is the reform that's needed. But how do you, how do you, have, how do you, you know, uh, advocate for this reform in the time of COVID? It was a health emergency. And so what we did was to um, take... Um, you know, use as, uh, as justification the fact that uh, COVID, the coronavirus, is a zoonotic disease. As we said, that it's really because of this, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the lines between the habitats, human habitats, animal, etc., have been blurred because of, uh, you know, unsustainable, etc., etc. And so we needed this. And besides, we said that, uh, you know, because of this COVID-19, we have seen 
uh, proliferation of semi, so many of these uh, packaging products <laughs> that use sustainable materials. And this one will lead to you know, uh, greater pollution, and that will give rise to even more communicable diseases. And so, yes, so we were able to, um, to put in that uh, PAP for SCP in the current Philippine Development Plan, and that was actually the first action plan that we launched after we launched the new PDP. So anyway, so just to give, uh, just to say that uh, for the third example, it's really a very comprehensive um, reform agenda that we now have under the Philippine Development Plan 2023 to 2028. But uh, again, as before, we have done the studies before, and so we're very clear as to the value proposition. So right now, we actually have a, a number of uh, action plans already uh, already in place, and we just need to, uh, to make sure that we are able to, uh, to, to form it in messages that are relevant at this time. So just to, uh, just to go back that, uh, like I said, crisis, turning crisis into opportunities do not happen as a matter of course. There's many things that you need to be, need to be done. First, you have to be clear as to reform that it, the reform that is needed. Be very strategic. Second, be clear also with respect to the value proposition. Do the, your complete staff work. And then, of course, engage the stakeholders, communicate the message clearly, uh, and uh, be ready to compensate the losers. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rosemary. Uh, Jeff Sachs, your turn, sir. Good morning to friends, and it's wonderful to be back at Sunway. Thank you, Jeffrey Chia, for your leadership and for bringing us together. Minister, thank you for being here, and Under Secretary, thank you for coming, and all of the other distinguished participants in, in this very important meeting. I'm really thrilled how the work uh, on ASEAN Sustainable Development is moving forward. This is uh, really a dream for us in our global program and in the program here. ASEAN is an extremely important region globally and a region we love and your region. So the chance to help think through some of the great uh, uh, challenges that this region faces in a, in a world filled with uh, growing challenges is very gratifying, very exciting, and I think uh, very promising as well. Let me say that of all social goals, of all the sustainable development goals, of all of the global objectives, there is nothing more important than education, because education can solve all the other objectives. And without education, nothing will be solved. Our societies will not even hold together. We need to learn to think. We need to understand the complex realities that we're facing. And that's why it's so wonderful to see how Sunway University is going from strength to strength. And uh, President Sobrandis, congratulations uh, on all of the progress that is evident. This is a great, great accomplishment, Jeffrey. Uh, and I just want to uh, applaud you for this. Uh, Prof uh, President Sobrandis and I were talking just before the meeting, and he was telling me about his uh, educate, classical education uh, in the Netherlands, and I was very jealous because I did not have such an education where I learned six languages and ancient Greek uh, and uh, Latin uh, when I was growing up in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, but it reminded me uh, of a concept that is extremely important uh, in Western culture, 
in Western history, and we were just in Athens a couple of weeks ago uh, discussing this, and the, the, the word is paideia. And the idea of paideia was an ancient Greek cultural concept that every citizen needed a proper education. And that education needed to uh, involve all of the disciplines and also moral education. And so there would be a curriculum that somebody growing up in uh, Pericles, Athens in uh, the fifth century BC would get that this would be the, uh, the, the way to grow up to be a, a full human being and a full citizen. I think it's a wonderful concept that we need a curriculum for the 21st century for us to be global citizens. We need a 21st century pedia. Um, we're trying to help build that uh, and think through that at SDSN. Um, I think it's one of the most important missions we could have. In the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 4 is quality education for everybody. And in SDG 4 is a target 4.7 uh, that uh, Jeffrey Chia and uh, others are part of leading globally. And that is not only the technical education, but ec education for global citizenship, for appreciation of culture, for understanding cultural diversity, for understanding cultural history, and for understanding the challenges of sustainable development. And it seems to me that this is really one of the most important things we need to hurry on, because the world's very complicated. It's very hard to understand, actually. I'm now uh, 68, and I've been trying to understand this world uh, Pretty much every day, I would say, uh, from uh, my college days, and I'm learning every day huge uh, things that were just completely outside of my knowledge, because there's a lot to uh, fit together in this jigsaw puzzle. And I think that, just to finish this <laughs> thought, that we really need to uh, do everything we can to help young people today understand the world that they're going to face. Because it's hard, and somehow we're not doing it, and we're not using well even the new technologies that we, use, that we have. I think all of our classrooms should be globally open somehow. Our students should be working together uh, by Zoom across nations, uh, across continents, talking with each other, learning from each other, doing joint homework assignments, somehow helping them to understand the interconnectedness of what we're facing. Because this, I think, is really essential. And I just want to commend Sunway University for taking this leadership role and for hosting SDSN Asia, and for having outside the 17 Sustainable Development Goals uh, so that every student every day thinks about them. And also on the walkway for saying, keep going, keep going, uh, and uh, keep moving, because I think that inspiration is absolutely essential. So we're in a mess globally. And we're, we're in big, a bigger mess than we were just a few years ago. I'd say no trends are going right right now uh, in almost any dimension of, of global life. And uh, the 2015 breakthroughs of the SDGs and the Paris Agreement are real breakthroughs, but they haven't changed the trajectory of the world yet. Um, and the world has been very difficult since 2015 on all counts, in geophysical terms, in the epidemic, which I'm going to 
just say I think was probably a, an accident of uh, our scientists, not a natural uh, event, uh, and uh, showing how fragile we are globally has been a very difficult eight years. And now we're in a full-scale war, and the war is escalating, and the two biggest powers in the world, China and the US, are at loggerheads with each other. And by the way, just to show how ridiculous things are, Henry Kissinger and President Xi met yesterday. And our White House said, oh, it's too bad that a private citizen could have these meetings and we don't have these contacts. The White House said that, <laughs> which is, first of all, weird. But second, if the White House would stop insulting China, they could have those meetings too. <laughs> you know, Henry Kissinger has just been a lot more polite, and the White House has been rude. And so it's very strange times and, and a very strange world. Now, we're hitting the highest temperatures probably in the last 125,000 years on the planet these days. And I just want to tell you that uh, I headed an institute at Columbia University for 15 years called the Earth Institute. And I had the terrifying job of having 300 climate scientists on my staff. And it's completely terrifying because they know what they're doing. And they just told me every day from 2002 onward what was going to happen. And I have an especially terrifying colleague named James Hansen, who many of you will know by name as the US government's lead climate scientist for 30 years for NASA. He's a very soft-spoken gentleman. He's from the Midwest, from Iowa. I'm from Michigan, so we're Midwesterners with our Midwestern twang accent. and. Um, he would come up to me just about every week for 20 years now and say, Jeff, it's worse than we thought. And one thing that I'll tell you, he laid out to me in 2002 just how this trajectory was going to go. I know it because I remember it reverberated. It shocked me from the beginning. And Many years ago, he said, by now, we are going to have these extraordinary breakthroughs in temperature because the scientists underneath all of this aren't waiting for the weather report day to day. They understand the underlying trends. And one of the things that, as I think everyone knows from the newspaper accounts, was happening was we have been warming year by year even through a La Nina phase of the Pacific. And the La Nina covers up the warming temporarily because it's cold waters in the Pacific. And Jim Hansen kept telling me for the last uh, three years, just wait when the La Nina ends and we switch to El Nino, <laughs> wait to see what's going to happen. And that's exactly what's happening right now. And what he just sent to me a paper uh, uh, a couple of days ago, an, a new paper, just up, updating the estimates of climate sensitivity. And his estimate is that we've had at least a 50% acceleration in warming per decade after 2010 compared to, with the pre-2010, that we're now warming at a rate of 0.27 degrees Celsius per decade meaning that we're going to hit 1.5 degrees within the next 10 years and probably within the next few years. So, and he's been telling me that for years. There's, there's, and he's been saying, by the way, which is interesting, just to give you an, another flavor of it, he's not a great fan of the IPCC because he says the IPCC is the consensus report. And he's not a consensus scientist. He's a cutting edge scientist. So he's always telling me the IPCC is about 10 years behind where we really are because things really are worse 
the ice sheets are worse, the acceleration of the climate is worse. So every time the IPCC comes out with its shocking news, and I say shocking news, then he sends me an email, Jeff, no, no, this is much too moderate. It's, it's worse, worse than you think because they don't account for the last four years of studies because it's a consensus document and so forth. So we're really on a terrible, terrible trajectory. And everywhere we're traveling right now, there's crisis, because uh, Sonia and I are traveling around the world to film a class to help high school students understand what's going on. And everywhere, there's deep crisis. We were in Athens two weeks ago, as I mentioned. We escaped just before the extreme heat wave came, reaching 45 degrees C. Right now, they had to close it down because you couldn't, it wasn't even safe to go, go there. Then the massive forest fires came about three days after we left. And this is happening everywhere right now. And I had a very sad experience. I was asked to give a Zoom to a sixth grade class in Brooklyn, New York, uh, last week. And I did. A friend of mine asked me to it's his daughter's class, so I gave a class to the sixth graders. They're all wearing masks, not because of COVID, but because of the Canadian forest fires, because they couldn't breathe the air. The school was closed one day. And still, we can't get our heads around this. You know, in the US, there is no national political consensus on anything, including this issue. None. We have no zero by 2050. I mean, the administration says something, but we have no national policies, no national vote, vote in, the, in the Congress, no national framework, because our political system is so corrupt that they will not vote for something outside of big coal and big oil. And so we have nothing. And then John Kerry goes to China and says, you should accelerate what you're doing. And we're 15 tons per capita CO2. China's about nine. Of course we should accelerate, but the United States lecturing to China? Are you kidding? So this is really the, the drama. Let me say what's needed, in my view, for every region of the world, but including ASEAN, and I was very happy to hear the Secretary General, Dr. Kao Kim Horn, speak and, uh, and uh, our minister speak very beautifully. The first thing that is needed is a plan. The first thing that's needed is a goal. The goal has to be to decarbonize no later than 2050, this is for sure. But the second thing that's needed is a plan to do that. This cannot be solved by market forces without a plan. It's impossible. It's far too complicated. It requires far too many public investments. It requires far too much legislative framework. It requires far too much coordination of agencies, of projects, of land use. This is not the markets are going to solve this. Private business is going to operate within a framework, a legal, regulatory, financial framework. But only the government can make the framework. And that requires a detailed plan. And it's not outlandish to have a detailed plan because 27 years to mid-century is not a very long time for public investment planning. And everything we're going to put in place by mid-century is basically already known now. Of course, the technologies will continue to improve and so forth, but fission, it's, uh, fusion, it's going to come, but in the second half of the 21st century. In the first half of the 21st century, we have the technologies we have. They're going to get better. They're going to be, some are still in demonstration mode, but they will be commercialized. But we have what we have, and we have to move. 
because otherwise we're going to face absolute loss of control because we're going to reach so many tipping points globally. Destruction of rainforests, ocean circulation collapse, collapse of ice sheets, that it's going to be completely out of our control unless we act. So we have to act with what we have and we need a plan for how to act and that plan should be basically a public investment plan and a regulatory plan between now and mid-century. How this is going to get done and how much it's going to cost. The planning needs to take place, and this is complicated, at all scales. KL needs a plan. Sunway City needs a plan, and it has a plan. But KL needs a plan. And Malaysia needs a plan. And ASEAN needs a plan. And they have to be interconnected and coherent with each other. And so it's like concentric circles. And that's a lot of planning and a lot of discussion and a lot of analysis that needs to be done. And these plans are very different from the nationally determined contributions, which was basically a bad idea in my view, which I said at the time. Because, but, but maybe it's, the politician said, we need that. We need to have something at our scale of the next five or 10 years so we actually do things. But the problem is a nationally determined contribution is something you do for three or four or five years. But that, the sum of those doesn't get you to 25 years. You have to start with the long-term plan to even know what to do in the short term. And if you just do the short term, you do every low cost trick you can do without realizing that will put you into a dead end five or 10 years from now because you're not doing the real long term things you need to do. So I would have dispensed with all of the short term stuff and said, everybody's responsible for a long term low emission development strategy. That's the only thing I would have done. And in the Paris negotiations, that's the only sentence I wanted in there, and it's sentence 4.19. And I just kept pressing, put in one sentence for a long-term low emissions development strategy. And that's really what is needed, because you can't do this as a sum of short-run improvisations. This is a long-term problem. But even, by the way, 25 years is not long term. It's a blink of an eye. Uh, but it's a longer term than governments. So this has to be beyond governments. This has to be national strategy. And of course, it needs to be spelled out in a way that Rosemary said, which is that people can understand it. If they can't understand it, it's useless. And one of the things economists get wrong is economists always talk about what tool to use. Should we have emissions trading? Should we have a permit? Should we have a carbon tax? No one understands it, but it sounds bad. But what people do understand is we're going to have solar fields or wind fields or we're going to have a nuclear project or we're going to have this or we're going to have that. They understand a bit where their electricity comes from, or we're going to be driving electric vehicles and we're going to be having charging stations, or we're going to be importing hydro from this place. That people can understand. So we need that kind of narrative. But that narrative has to be based on an actual plan. And again, in the United States, we have nothing like that because our politicians are I can't even use the right words because they're impolite. <laughs> but I would say the process is so corrupt. And the chairman of our Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee owns two coal mines. So go figure. <laughs> and he's considered the consensus senator, Senator Joe Manchin. Well, he is the consensus among a small corrupt elite. And that's why we're completely stuck. 
But I have a theory about change in the world, which is eventually the United States will do the right thing when the other 192 UN member states do the right thing. So I'm trying to get all the other countries to do the right thing. <laughs> and then the United States will finally figure out what to do. <laughs> One basic point is you can't do decarbonization country by country. No country is big enough and self-contained enough to do this efficiently within its own borders. Of course, it's technically feasible, but the cost would be out of sight. So the way that ASEAN can afford this is by having a grid that is ASEAN-wide and even bigger than ASEAN. And this is really basic. And the minister mentioned that we're moving towards a power pool that is ASEAN-wide trading. This is extremely important. I think the right unit at a minimum for this region is the RCEP unit. RCEP is the 10 ASEAN countries plus China, Japan, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. That's a great grouping for the energy transformation. Australia could add in a tremendous amount of renewable energy to this region because it's got a lot more sunshine than ASEAN does in general. ASEAN's got a lot more rainfall, a lot more tropical forests, and Australia has a lot more desert. And a good submarine cable can carry a lot of those green electrons here at low cost. And so an integrated system makes a tremendous amount of sense. And so the regional challenge is fundamental. This is why the geopolitics is also crucial. There is no substitute for regional cooperation. There is no way in the world to do this without China, intimately involved. And there's no way to do this without China, Japan, Korea, all cooperating closely together. This, of course, is again outside the US playbook, which is to divide each region so that there's one side versus another side and we have our military bases here and all the rest. This is the outmoded ancient divide et impera principle. It will kill us all if we continue in this way. We need close, neighbors need to cooperate with each other. It's the most basic principle in the world. All those ancient border clashes and so on mean nothing in the 21st century compared to the challenges that we face of having trans-border neighborly cooperation. They just don't mean anything compared to the real problems that we face. So for every country, I would say, look to your left, look to your right, look ahead, look behind you, and cooperate with all of those. And if you're on a border where you're not cooperating, go send a delegation to start talking. Because otherwise, this is just impossible. And anyway, these ancient rivalries maybe made some understanding when we couldn't see the world as a whole. We weren't so crowded together. We didn't have technologies that made us completely interdependent but this is completely outmoded now. So when you do the planning, do the planning regionally. Tell the US, just be nice. <laughs> and if you're polite, you too can have an invitation to speak with President Xi.
The last part that I want to mention is everything needs to be financed. This is an investment challenge. And nobody's current budget can pay for what needs to be done. Everything has to be done through finance. This is long-term investment that needs long-term financing. And the financing needs to be at scale. And it needs to be uh, based on a plan. Because if it's not based on a plan, it's all too risky. If it's based on a plan, then it makes sense what's being financed and the risks can be managed appropriately. And so a lot of attention needs to be put on creating the right financing mechanisms and financing system. I think that ASEAN should explore creating an ASEAN Development Bank or Green Infrastructure Bank as part of this strategy. ASEAN has, you have institutions, of course, the Asian Development Bank, which I think is a very good institution, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, a new, the, the, the new bank that China created in the past decade, the new development bank based in Shanghai, that's the BRICS Bank. That's all good, but I doubt that it's enough for ASEAN's needs. Uh, I think ASEAN needs it's 600 million people. It's the same population as Latin America. Latin America has two of its own development banks. It's got the Inter-American Development Bank and it's got the Latin American Development Fund or the COF. And those really help those countries to multiply their resources. And ASEAN has the challenge that about half the countries are credit worthy and the other half are not credit worthy. And so there's a big problem of making the interconnections in the countries that are not investment grade, but they need to be integrated in the system. And there's a big problem about making all of the interconnections in general because that requires specialized finance and specialized institutions and creative financing. So I think creating something for ASEAN is feasible, would multiply the credit worthiness, would multiply the amount of financing available, and should be looked at as uh, one uh, option to put on the table and something that I hope our work can do. The other point I would make is to use uh, the really important initiatives of China, especially the Belt and Road Initiative, as a key part of solving this problem. The Belt and Road Initiative is, in my view, one of the most important and positive initiatives in the world and really very appropriate of China because China, as a low-cost provider of large-scale infrastructure and a saving surplus economy naturally had a good uh, reason for creating a large-scale regional financing program. And at the beginning, the quality of the investments were not very good because basically it was also part of China's statecraft that ask your partner what do you want and we'll finance it. And that led to a lot of pretty low quality investments, I would say. And I think that the program is improving a lot right now because first of all, if you go on investing low quality projects, you'll end up with a lot of bad debt on your hands and China's just getting the first taste of that. And uh, I think that that's sobering. So the idea that these investments ought to be good investments is becoming uh, more uh, salient uh, in China's policy making. But the second thing that happened, of course, was that many of the early investments were in coal plants uh, or in fossil fuel-based technology. And China heard an earful, rightly, internationally, every time I opened my mouth on the issue for many years, including from me and others, that this needs to be green and, uh, and sustainable financing. The good thing about it is China is actually the low cost producer of all zero carbon technologies, period. 
whether it's photovoltaics, whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's uh, wind, whether it's uh, long distance, uh, uh, high voltage direct current uh, transmission systems, whether it's 5G, and we're now moving to 5.5G, and soon we'll be at 6G uh, within uh, the next uh, six or seven years. China's a good partner for that, uh, and uh, with plenty of production opportunities throughout ASEAN also for a lot of industrialization at cutting edge technologies. So I think that that's another very important part of the story, and I hope that the region really uh, takes, takes that on and takes that forward. The other point I would add is, of course, India will become more and more important and more and more breakthroughs in coming years. Uh, India is now the fastest growing major economy in the world and is likely to remain so for the next decade at least, and it's based on very big steps forward, especially in digital platforms and in universal digital access, and that can be a big help as well and a big partnership in the ASEAN region. So all of this is to say this is, we know, we've known a long time that Asia will determine the future of the planet in the 21st century. There's no doubt about this. And uh, all signs point to the fact of remarkable potential progress, very rapid favorable change. I think the 2050 decarbonization is completely within reach by the way, also of China and Indonesia. Uh, so I think that because the technological advances are coming so fast and the costs of the infrastructure are falling so rapidly. So all of this is to say this workshop is extremely timely. I'm very grateful uh, to everybody participating uh, and especially grateful to Sunway University for making it possible for us to get together. Thank you so much. This concludes the morning session. We are now move on to the parallel sessions that are happening in the locations identified in your schedule. Thank you very much.